first quite a, uh, an extensive area in your presentation today uh, across a landscape of 117 days in government uh, and a commitment to deliver on promises that were made prior to the election. As we indicated, here is an opportunity for you to ask questions of your Premier. Uh, if you have a question, if you please uh, raise your hand, a microphone will be brought to you. If you could identify who you are or the organisation you represent, uh, it would be great if you had a question, not make a comment, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll get on and get as many as we possibly can. So, I have over here, thank you. Hi, I'm Tara Piazza, I'm from Public Transport Victoria. Premier, thank you very much um, for enabling us to listen to you today. My question is regards to the gender diversity announcements that you've made recently, which I'm very supportive of and believe very much in. I'm a uh, female board director on a nod for profit. Just wondering that now that you've put out the policy platform, is your government planning on uh, announcing any initiatives to help make that happen? Tara, thanks, thanks for your question. Uh, this is at our state conference on Saturday. I, um, announce that from this point on, so it's very difficult, we can't undo appointments that were made previously, but from this point on, all Victorian government boards that are paid boards, including appointments to the Supreme Court, both the Trial Division, the Court of Appeal, the County Court, the Magistrates Court, the VCAT list, Coroner's Court, the Works, are all judicial appointments and all paid boards, from water boards to hospital boards to uh, those who we have a say in in the higher education sector, fit no less than 50% will be women. Now, I've been accused, uh, well, I've been accused of doing the right thing. So people have been very supportive. It's been quite uh, over, overwhelming actually the last couple of days. Then there have been others, the usual angry crowd who give you a lecture about merit and it should be the best person. That's fine. People are entitled to their view. Then there's another train of thought that says there's not enough qualified women to fill these spots. That's that's not right. That's simply not right. But even if you accepted that argument, wouldn't you do something about it? Wouldn't you do something about it? And I think searching for, uh, training up, supporting uh, women to play those roles, and the beauty of government is we make the appointments regularly. They're, we kind of rotate, we have a nine-year limit, three-year three, three, three year terms normally. Uh, and we have a great diversity. Everything from our galleries and museums to the way Treasury Corporation and the Victorian Managed Funds, the, everything. We've got the whole works covered. We have great opportunity with a proactive policy to give many, many women who are already qualified and skilled, but to give them the experience to then hopefully uh, play other roles, whether it be in the corporate world, the non-government organisation world. Uh, I don't accept that there's not enough talented women out there, but even if you did accept that logic, wouldn't you then put in place exactly what I announced on Saturday uh, and go out and make it much better? In terms of training, we'll have more to say about some of those capacity building exercises, but I think appointing people is not a bad place to start. Premier, I'm delighted you've been reading the CEDA five-year report on women in leadership that we released on uh, on Friday and uh, been regularly catching up on the five-year programs that we've rolled out right around Australia on the Women in Leadership series and uh, it's been reflected in your policy announcements. So thank you very much for that. Next only question. A, yeah. Only a four-year term, so that's why we have to be quick about it. <laughs> David. Uh, David Buckingham from Monash University. Is the Port of Hastings development dead? And if it is, is there an alternative being developed? Uh, thanks, David, and thanks for the work that Monash does. Um, I was informed, I didn't know this till after the election, but I was informed that I'm the first graduate of Monash University to serve as the Premier of Victoria. So after a pretty unspectacular academic career, Monash are really happy to see me these days. It's <laughs> terrific. It's very great. It's very, it's wonderful. So uh, the 48th Premier and, uh, and the first from Monash. So you give all the team at Monash my best. Um, the, uh, the Port of Hastings, look, the, the previous government had this blind loyalty to the Port of Hastings. When there is not the land side benefits anywhere near it, there's not the freight links, there's not the road links, the road rail, there's no air link. Uh, water side, there's some challenges too. There's some Ramsar wet, uh, wetlands down there that frankly people are not just going to roll over and say, yes, you can do whatever you want there. So it's not quite this nirvana that the previous government, like the port of all ports. No, it is not. No, it is not. Now, some will agree with me, some won't. What we say 
is that let's have a proper process. Let's compare and contrast. Let's look at competing business cases between a Bay West option, which on a land side point of view does have the rail, road and airport linkages. Uh, we think that we favour that project, but having had about 20 staff when I was a leader of the opposition, we made a judgment that we wouldn't try and do a business case for both of those. We would send it to Infrastructure Victoria instead, uh, and we would then get them to make a you know, really detailed and careful uh, examination of that, uh, and then we'll make a decision at that point. There is, there is some time, though, and the reason I say that is I have a fundamentally more optimistic view about the, about the, the kind of movements that TU you can get TEU you can get through the Port of Melbourne. I think it is a, an asset that has a much longer life than many others do. Um, you'd probably expect me to say that given that we're in the process of selling a long-term lease. But with attendant infrastructure and some improvements around it, and we'll have more to say about some of those issues soon, uh, we think that uh, this second container port or replacement bulk large-scale container port is some years away. In any event, a quick decision or the right one, I think you should choose the right one. So it's to be to be uh, determined, but we've been pretty clear that we favour the Bay West option, but let's wait and see if it actually stacks up. That's the best of infrastructure decision making, rather than blind obsessions and, and these kind of love affair things that don't back, they're not backed up by any actual analysis and rigour. Um, that might be okay to do with your own money, but it's not our money, it belongs to Victorian taxpayers. Hello, Jason Kambowski from Westpac. Um, Mr Premier, unlike other states, we don't have things we can dig up out of the ground and, and send off overseas to sell. Uh, not since the 1860s, could, could, you know, during the gold rush, could we survive on that. The last time I checked, education was our biggest export. I think it's four and a half, five billion to the economy. What else can your government do to ensure that we grow that opportunity? I know you've announced spending around TAFE, um, and initiatives around TAFE, but what else can the government do to make sure that that export industry continues to grow and develop? Well, thanks, thanks for your question, because um, it highlights two points. Firstly, that notion of human capital and investing in people and the, investing in the, cap the productive capacity of our best and brightest, and indeed in all of us, um, that's always been our way, certainly in, apart from those few years when we did dig riches out of the ground. Um, and the second point you make, which is a very good reminder to us all, that international, uh, international education is our number one export. Uh, it is such a big part of our story and it can be a really big part of our future. A uh, couple of examples. Uh, having a training system that's much more sustainable is critically important to better international education revenue and better international education outcomes. Uh, having uh, marked this out as an industry that's set for growth, so we've got a $200 million uh, job Future Industries Fund, international education is one of six sectors that we've marked out as really not, not just possible but likely indeed almost certain to grow, but how do we try and deliver that outcome perhaps a bit quicker, a bit quicker and a, in a more uh, sustainable, in a more sustainable and a more strategic way. Uh, there are lots of things you can do. Just one, one example. Uh, we ran a very successful, the first inbound trade mission that as part of our refocusing. So rather than sending two or 3,000 people to China, and, and, and I, no offence to anyone who went on those, any of those missions, but I don't think 2,000 anythings impressed the uh, uh, Chinese. It's just, like the notion of scale, like 2,000 people turning up in China does not impress anyone in China, right? It just doesn't. And again, it kind of, it, and it's, it's, it's at odds with this notion that we've always been the qualitative state. We've always been smarter and more hard-working, more innovative, more uh, creative. Just turning up on mass, or oh, that'll that'll secure a whole lot of. No, it doesn't. Inbound trade missions, on the other hand, much more uh, bespoke, much more tailored, uh, much more Victorian in many ways. The first of which, 240 delegates from 14 different countries. They were out here in the week, about 10 days leading up to the Grand, Grand Prix. They went to the races on Saturday. They had a big dinner at the gallery on Friday night. Um, a lot of a lot of deals were written that week and we're in the process of tallying up just how successful it was. International education made up more than a quarter uh, and Chinese made up more than one half. Uh, the next biggest group were uh, from the subcontinent uh, India and some others. 
It was a great opportunity to stand in the paddock, to stand in the uh, vineyard at the cellar door, in the kitchen uh, of, a, of, of many of our finest, uh, finest uh, restaurants, in the medical research laboratory on the factory floor, to see it, to feel it, you know, to get that tangible sense of the things we do best. There's no better advertisement. So more of those, some of which will be very much sector specific. So there's one on wine coming up in uh, May, uh, and there will be several around international, uh, international education, both higher education but also vocational education. And not to be too, not to be letting things, you know, out of the bag, because this is a very, very competitive market. But I think we've got a great opportunity to engage much better with some, with some sub-regional centres in India and China look at where other people are targeting. Don't go and try and compete there. Don't compete with Sydney, I think, in the kind of uh, Gujarat stuff that they've done over in uh, India. We go and find some other markets and make those ours. So some of that will be important as well. But you're right to highlight it. It's a significant strength, one that needs to grow, and I, I'm confident it will. You know, the best teaching, the best uh, curriculum, uh, in a great place, a safe place to come and live and study, uh, Great for cultural exchange and knowledge exchange. Uh, great branding as well, uh, but also the income is pretty good too. Which the government's banker, I'm sure, is very pleased with. Raman Singh from Monash University. <coughs> uh, Premier, uh, I had a chance to discuss with you during your election campaign about uh, Monash University and and then what we could do better there. First of all, congratulations from Monash to be the first premier from that institution. Uh, <clears throat> look, part of my question's answer has already been given as you are talking about the tertiary education. But international image of any educational institution comes from basically research. How good you are in research and it flows down to undergraduate education and all that. So in that sense, um, we all know that the research input from a federal government has, uh, is going down at its best. So what, as Victoria, as the intellectual capital that we talk about, what your government would like to do for certain things that universities like Monash or Melbourne or such universities which are research active universities, um, like at Monash we have a few a uh, few research centers in the area of energy or infrastructure or in medical science. I lead one such center in energy, and that's why I had talked to you about it during one of your campaign meetings with the Indian community. I asked a question about Monash. So my question is that what uh, better could the government do for encouraging particularly uh, the, the focused research areas in such places? Thank you. Uh, I think clarity is really important in this. You know, we can't pretend to be the federal government, so we can't pretend that we've got a National Health and Medical Research Council, for instance. We can't pretend that on industry-specific, scientific and, and other uh, investigation and research, we can match the funding that the federal government uh, have in place through many, many different grant programs. What we can do, though, is we can, do, we can deliver some of, the, some of the critical infrastructure. For instance, the... Um, Synchrotron and its nine beam lines would not have been possible without the state Labor government. Would never have, never have happened. Uh, and it's just outside my own local community. I know it well. I've visited there many, many times, mainly from a health and medical research point of view. But you now it's a, it is a magical place because it's not so much individual streams of research, but it's the cross pollinisation, people from vastly different fields. Um, that's where the magic happens when people start sharing ideas and almost new disciplines start to get uh, start to form. Uh, that was a state uh, initiative. The future of which we'll have to see how that unfolds in you know, as we uh, look to the look to the future. Give you another example. It's not quite a synchrotron, so it's not a big scientific tool, but it'll be, I think, a proving ground for one of those other sectors that I think is set to grow, and that's the pharmaceutical sector biomedical engineering, uh, medical, medical uh, devices. I think that is an area where we can, we already have a significant presence. I know CSL is here today, uh, and no doubt there'll be other pharma companies in the room, uh, but pharmaceuticals, particularly bespoke products into markets where uh, you get much better outcomes if you actually 
treat the person rather than just a one-size-fits-all uh, market. And this is about fundamentally targeting Asia and understanding that there are a range of different ways in which we can get better outcomes if we have much more specific um, uh, much more specific uh, products. Uh, what I'm referring to is our commitment to build the Monash Heart Hospital. So this is not part of Monash Health, it'll be separate to Monash Health uh, and it'll be on land that we will secure from Monash Uni and it'll be a partnership between Monash Health, so the local state government health service, Monash University, the Centre for Engineering, Science and the CSIRO, that important partnership that is in that brand new building at Monash now, uh, potentially a whole range of pharma companies, medical device companies. This is the sort of investment that we can make and drive that delivers, well, untold, untold uh, progress, uh, access to new markets. It's, you can't really imagine where that might take us. The number of blockbuster drugs and other products that may well come from that sort of standing inf infrastructure, that's the precondition to really exciting research, the outcomes of which, the wonderment of which we really, we can't even, we can't even begin to, to, to actually list those. So that's, that's, that's a couple of examples of things we can do, but clarity of purpose, so knowing what we can and can't do is really important in this. Nathan Abbott, Colin Biggers and Paisley Lawyers. Mr. Premier, I, also have a question regarding your announcement over the weekend of the government's intention that appointments should be shared equally between uh, men and women. Um, one of the things I noticed, unless I've misunderstood him, is that the Leader of the Opposition relatively quickly um, endorsed that initiative. Perhaps it's an idea for our times and I'm just wondering whether you see any scope for a similar level of cooperation in respect of planning for infrastructure projects, whether that, whether that might be perhaps a feature of uh, your vision for the way that could be managed in the future. Uh, well, I was, obviously I was pleased to make the announcement. We'd given some thought to it. And I just, let me, it gives me an opportunity to make a couple of brief comments about the context you should see that announcement in. Uh, I was very proud in May last year to commit us that if we won the election, we would deal with as no other state has, we would deal properly with the number one law and order challenge in our state today. And that, of course, is the epidemic of family violence, the national emergency that is family violence. And I won't recite all the statistics and numbers, but I think it's, we don't need to anymore convince anyone that this is the number one law and order issue. Uh, and from a standing start, within 100 days, Royal Commission up and running, fully operational. And it'll report to us in about 12 months' time, a little bit less, and it'll give us the answers that we need and then a, an awful lot of hard work and very considerable amounts of money will need to be invested. But the time is worth taking and the money's worth spending. Uh, our, I think our, our women and children are worth that and more. Uh, however, I think outcomes for women, and I'm very careful not to sound patronising because it's not my intention, but I think outcomes for women start with attitudes toward women. And that's where the 50-50 policy position comes, comes from. Uh, and that's where our absolute determination to deliver it comes from. Uh, we may not get there in terms of the total composition of boards at 50-50. That might well depend how long we're um, in power for. That's a matter for the Victorian community. Uh, but certainly over these four years, all the appointments we make will be no less than 50-50. I was pleased that the... Uh, leader of the Liberal Party was quick, was very quick to come out and say, yes, that's a great idea and it's probably been a long time coming. Um, I think that's politics at its best. If there's no argument to be had, then don't argue. You know, if you agree, uh, move on. Uh, that's politics at its best. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, the model around infrastructure Victoria is at the risk of being naive again, but the, the promise of it, the potential of it, is that you do after a period of time, that might be 10 years, it might be longer, I don't know, it might be less, but you do start to get an agreed list of things that we know all of us need to do. And that agreement means that they're no longer part of the political contest, they're an agreed agenda. 
They're not the exclusive agenda. There'll be lots of things to argue about. Politicians will always find things to argue about. But some things, you do, a, you do a service to a better outcome. So you get a better outcome because you argue about them and you debate and discuss. And some things, I think, you compromise good outcomes because they're part of the political, um, the political contest. And all too often, things like infrastructure uh, are in the latter category. So we, we, we do live in hope that there'll be bipartisan support on a range of things, particularly the formation and the work of Infrastructure Vic Victoria. Thank you. David Frizzell from SBC Ardmona up at Sheverton, which was uh, formerly a safe uh, National Party seat and uh, now held by the independent uh, Susanna Sheed. But uh, I think it was uh, you know, a win for everyone there. Um, as an, uh, I guess I congratulate you as an alternative government on um, carrying through with the promise of the $22 million for that manufacturing industry. And, um, you know, gratefully received and um, will be well used, I can assure you. We, um, there's many ways that the uh, state government can assist uh, manufacturing companies in infrastructure, roads, ports, railway, and you're already addressing railway. Another one is at a more micro level, I guess, but also important, and it, and it sends a message to all manufacturers, and, and that is whether it be wine or fruit or whatever, just the uh, procurement policy. And uh, I'm just interested in your views and what the, you know, the state government policy is moving forward on procurement of locally produced product, uh, Australian made locally produced product, versus price straight out as a, um, as a you know, thing to be bargained with? Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. And uh, uh, let me just make a couple of comments about SPC Ardmona. Uh, we were very, very proud to be out early and to make a commitment that I think then set the tone and, and saw the government of the day uh, state government of the day make a commitment, not, not as a, not as a corporate welfare, it was good industry policy, it was about supporting new lines for new products for new markets. And that, uh, with a co-investment from Coca-Cola Amatil, uh, that saved those couple of thousand jobs and I think has set you up for a much stronger future. Uh, it's very difficult to think of the Golden Valley and indeed the Ovens Valley without SPC, uh, without those jobs. Uh, Shepparton does it pretty tough at the best of times. Uh, and the notion of allowing the cannery to go, it's much more than that now. It was about helping it become much more than, a, uh, uh, than the kind of cannery that it, that it had been. Uh, it was good industry policy and we take the view that there is a role for government to play uh, in those co-investments. Uh, the other way in which you support industry, you're absolutely right, to have a parochial, that is to say a good government procurement policy and to define best value in a broad um, frame. So to have a broad context to that. It's not just about the numbers at the bottom of the tender. You've got to deliver value. Again, it's not our money. It belongs to every single Victorian. But where you can embed skills attainment, where you can protect diversity, uh, where you can have some strategic issues at play as well, and we see that in terms of defence procurement at the moment, not just submarines, but Land 400, uh, supply ships, all sorts of different decisions. We seem to have lost focus, particularly at a national level, that the power of a government's purchase is very, very important. There's no bigger purchaser of goods and services in the state of Victoria than the state of Victoria. So who we do business with and the terms under which we do that business makes a big difference. A big difference. Now we're not running a kind of a command economy. We do have to be responsible, but you can get the balance right. It's about emphasis on whether every hospital, for instance, should be serving SPC peaches or baked beans or whatever it might be. I'd like to think that we can drive that content up over, over time. It's a bit complex in that I'm not entirely sure what's being purchased now and with a devolved governance model, individual purchasing offices at individual hospitals or not just hospitals, lots of other parts of government will be making their own uh, decisions. Uh, if we can bring some consistency to that, then we will. But just like the 37 trains that we will order in coming weeks, which I announced today, local content matters for them. Uh, it matters in the manufacturing process in food and fibre, in terms of professional services. You know, we don't just hand out the banking contract to anyone. We have some expectation around skills and a local employment profile. We need to be much more discerning in those uh, decisions, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to really significant scale projects. I'll leave you with this example. We made a commitment and we will deliver on this. 
that major Victorian government infrastructure projects are projects of state significance, at least 10% of the workforce will be uh, apprentices. Now that's significant. Now some would say that's going to add to the uh, cost base. Well, they're not costs, they're investments. Because if you haven't got a workforce, you've got no future. No future at all. Um, but that won't necessarily happen if we just let the market, leave the market to itself. That's good procurement policy. Uh, whether we can do that in um, food and beverage, um, I'll have to come back to you on that. But if there is an opportunity to get what I, from your question, I take it's a pretty low level up a bit, then certainly we're, we're more, than, more than happy to talk about that. Premier, uh, thank you so much uh, for your response to a fairly wide ranging set of questions here this afternoon and thank you for your address. To formally move a vote of thanks, could I invite Mr Richard Owen, the Chairman of ExxonMobil. Thank you.